Thank you, Dean. That was an extraordinarily generous and, and well-conceived introduction, very rare in this business. I can tell you someone who's actually read the material that he's introducing, so I'm grateful for that. So it's typically my desire to talk about something called corruption, and I increasingly find that I can't do it, or I won't do it, or I find it's too negative to talk about something called corruption, too dark. Instead, I want to talk about something a little lighter, <laughs> the opposite side of corruption. What we can think of is the concepts arrayed against corruption, what we might think of as concepts that help us understand corruption, the other side, integrity as the opposite to corruption, or we could think of independence as the opposite to corruption. I want to use these two concepts, independence and integrity, as ideals that I think help us understand a framing generation and with which we can understand this concept of corruption. So let's start with independence. The framers of our Constitution were obsessed with this idea of independence by which I don't mean the independence of 1776 when we liberated ourselves from the oppressive British. I mean instead the independence that was in their head circa 1785. As increasingly anyone who thought about the matter honestly began to believe that America was a failure. That a certain corruption had destroyed the integrity of the nation, that the independence of the nation was being threatened by a lack of independence, an increasing dependence producing dependence within our government, as Jefferson described it. Dependence begets subservience and venality, suffocates the germ of virtue, and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. What Americans increasingly recognized before the birth of our Constitution was that this was what government across the country had become. And they sought non-dependent, independent governments that could give the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim was a set of institutions, we could say constitutions, against that improper dependence. But to conceive of improper dependence is to imply that there's such a thing as proper dependence. There's such a thing as the right kind of dependence. And indeed, in the framers' conception of exactly the proper alignment of authority inside the government, there was a conception of proper dependence. So proper dependence for courts would include a dependence upon the law, building and deciding cases constantly in light of the law, drawing their authority from this dependency upon the law. But by contrast, the proper dependence of a Congress is a dependence upon the people. Indeed, the Federalist Papers repeatedly denounced the concept of dependency, just like Jane Austen repeatedly denounced the concept of dependency, except like Jane Austen and like the framers, the Federalist Papers had limited conceptions of dependency that were appropriate. And the one concept of dependency the Federalist Papers recommend is the concept of the Congress remaining dependent upon the people. And then the executive, interestingly, has a dependency on both the law and upon the people. In the context of executive executing the law, it is in light of the law that the executive acts, and as the leader of the nation takes inspiration from the will of the people, the only elected official who can speak for the whole of the people. But if that's the concept of proper dependence, then improper dependence is a dependence drawn outside of those proper channels. So if Congress is properly dependent upon the people, then improper dependence would be Congress 
increasingly developing a dependence on something other than the people in executing and acting upon its authority. Proper dependence translated into improper dependence because it's a dependence of the wrong kind and from the con original conception of our framers, meaning then not properly independent. Now, the nice thing about that way of thinking about independence, that way of thinking about the conception of independence as an instance of proper dependence, is that it fits other contexts as well. If we think about what the independence of science means, it means a science dependent upon the truth. That dependency is the core dependency for a proper science. Or the independence of medicine means a medicine that's dependent upon the science. It is that dependency that properly defines how medicine is to perform its work, not a dependence on other influences, such as the profit motive of a doctor. This dependence framework is the focus of any such institution, the thing that people within that institution should focus upon. And from this perspective, the concept of corruption simply means one who has been distracted from the proper focus within the institution within which he or she operates. One who has lost focus, who has lost the integrity of the institution within which he or she functions. Now, I want to convince you of something you are already convinced of. I want to convince you of the presence of the problem I'm describing, this loss of integrity, this loss of independence in this institution. This loss of independence because of a dependency on something other than the people, an influence inside that institution other than an influence directed from the people, an influence within an economy of influence that includes the people but not exclusively, or not even primarily. And to convince you of this argument, I want to draw upon a source, a fantastic new book by Robert Kaiser of the Washington Post called So Damn Much Money, a book which describes an extraordinary change over the past 25 years in the culture of Washington, a change brought about by a radical change in the character of the industry of lobbying. And as Kaiser describes, this industry has produced a certain kind of economy inside of Washington. And the economy has three components. At the core are lobbyists who increasingly treat with members, who then in turn treat with interests, which in then reward the lobbyists. Each in this economy pays the other each within this economy depends upon the other. So as Kaiser describes, interests pay the lobbyists. So as he writes, in the earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. But in the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar American yearning to get rich. The claim being the focus of lobbyists shifted from the policy wonk focus to leveraging the power of the industry into enormous profit. So this industry, which is a nine to $12 billion industry, about the size of the recording industry in America, has produced extraordinary wealth by the leading lobbyists. This man, uh, Gerald Cassidy, who is credited with building the architecture of earmark uh, lobbying, has amassed more than $100 million in personal wealth from this industry he helped found. And not surprisingly, as the lobbyist industry has become so enormously profitable, Washington itself has become one of the richest areas in the whole of the United States. Increasingly, the top counties are counties from the DC area because the business of selling policy, as lobbyists refer to it, has become such a lucrative business. So interests pay lobbyists, then lobbyists pay members. 
They pay members both during the tenure of a member and after the tenure of a member. During the tenure of a member, lobbyists pay with cash. And I don't mean the brown paper bags that are common in Chicago. I mean cash <laughs> in the support for campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members have become increasingly dependent upon lobbyists as a source of campaign funding. As they spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money, lobbyists become the suppliers, or to push the metaphor a little bit here, the pushers of this source of this dependency within this system. This too, Kaiser says, is something new. As Kaiser writes, money has been part of American politics forever. On occasion, in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. So for example, compare this man, Max Baucus, a man who represents 0.3% of the American population. Yet when he sat at the top of the committee that would control whether health care would get through the Senate, he opened his campaign coffers and received more than $4 million in contributions from the very interests who his committee would regulate. Compare him with this man, John Stennis, Mississippi Senator, no choir boy himself. But when he was head of the Armed Services Committee and a colleague suggested to him that they hold a fundraiser for defense contractors, Stennis replied to the colleague, would that be proper? I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. Now this ethic of Stennis, just 25 years old, is completely gone from the culture of Washington today. Indeed, the reverse is the ethic of Washington today. The reverse which says, it is because I hold life and death over you that I have the right and power to demand as much from you in contributions as I can. In this sense, it's during the life of a member in Congress that the member becomes dependent upon the lobbyist. And then after, the lobbyist pays the members with their future. Capitol Hill has increasingly become, as my friend Congressman Jim Cooper from Tennessee puts it, a quote, farm league for K Street. An increasing business model dominates Washington where members and staffers and bureaucrats increasingly think of their life focused on life after government, life as lobbyists. So 50% of senators between 1998 and 2004, as estimated by public citizen, left the Senate to become lobbyists. 42% of members of the House, for obvious reasons. They go from a life where they make $180,000 a year, a little bit more than what my students make after they graduate from the Harvard Law School. And then after six or eight years, they graduate to the partnership. But the partnership for a member of Congress is a lobbyist making half a million dollars or a million dollars a year. Indeed, everyone in this system increasingly depends upon this system surviving. And in that sense, they resist transformations that might change this power in the way that lobbyists can control members. And then members reward interests through policies that get changed. Sometimes very profitably, so the University of Kansas did a study of this, this statute, the um, American Jobs Creation Act, and they were able to calculate the lobbyist dollars spent to bring about a particular amendment to that act. And they could determine that the return on investment for those lobbyist dollars spent was 22,000%, signaling a little bit why more and more businesses are turning to lobbying as the obvious way for them to increase their bottom line, because however clever their next new widget is, it won't produce a 22,000% return. And sometimes quite brazenly. So the New York Times at the beginning of February published this story about Charles Schumer traveling up to Wall Street to participate in a fundraiser in Wall Street to help raise money to return the Democrats into control of the United States Senate. 
but he met with some chilly reception on Wall Street, as the New York Times put it. The titans of finance at a recent closed door meeting accused him, Charles Schumer, of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now remember, this is Charles Schumer, the single senator perhaps most responsible for radically deregulating Wall Street. Yet this man is insufficiently pro-Wall Street for Washington, and he needs to put himself before this group to demand, to plead for their support in light of the power which they hold. Yet, the politicians deny that that relationship has any effect on the actual legislation that they pass. They say it's ridiculous, I was told by one member. Maybe it affects access. As former Representative Mazzoli from Kentucky put it, people who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have the access, and access is it. Access is power. But they insist it, do, quote, doesn't change results, as I've been told. But I find this pretty hard to believe, at least if you want to be charitable in interpreting what Congress does. Because there's a host of easy cases, the kind of 2 plus 2 equals 4 cases, which our government just consistently gets wrong. So for example, an area which I spent about a decade of my life working on, copyright. That work as a policy activist began on October 27th, 1998, when President Bill Clinton signed into law a statute honoring this great American, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Now, the Sonny Bono Act extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. And of course, the question Congress was supposed to be considering when they decided whether to pass that statute or not was whether extending the term of an existing copyright could advance the public good. And what all of us know about copyright is that copyrights are monopolies granted for the purpose of creating an incentive to produce something new. And at least in a world governed by the laws of physics of this world rather than the world governed by the laws of physics of Star Trek, we know that incentives are prospective. No matter what Congress does, George Gershwin is not going to produce anything more. <laughs> so when asking the question whether it could possibly make sense to extend the term of existing copyrights, the answer is it could not make public policy sense to extend the term of existing copyrights. And indeed, when we challenged the statute in the Supreme Court, this left-wing economist, oh wait, this is Milton Friedman, right-wing, Nobel Prize winning economist, joined a brief in the Supreme Court challenging this statute, but said he would only join the brief if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. <laughs> so obvious was it that this could not advance the public good, yet apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress passed that statute. So here's an easy public policy question, which Congress just gets wrong. Or think about another case, an area I've been working on recently, nutrition. There's a consensus among people who know something about the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization decided they'd try to advance public policy on the basis of that consensus. They established a standard that said that no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, they have this sweet little logo here, they were not happy with this. They went ballistic. There they are, ballistic. <laughs> they actually got the Senate of the United States to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if the WHO didn't back down from this ridiculous standard. Here's Larry Craig writing the WHO, telling them they have to back down. Instead, Larry Craig and other senators wanted the uh, WHO to adopt the standard that 25 percent of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. Now, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated standards saying your daily caloric intake should, could include up to 25% from added sugar. That was a balanced diet, according to our government. So this is what you can consume, according to the health 
czars in our government. You can begin with M&Ms, I'm sorry, Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast, a glass of milk. For lunch, you can have a cheeseburger. For dinner, you can have pepperoni pizza, three slices of pepperoni pizza, and of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That is a balanced diet according to our government. So the point again is easy public policy question, which the government just gets wrong. Or think maybe most profoundly about the context of global warming. There is a consensus, or at least there was until Washington suffered a snowstorm this winter, but there's a consensus <laughs> about global warming that uh, we're doing it. As Gore puts the consensus, the debate's over. There are five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Someone wanted to do a study of how robust that consensus was. So they took a random selection of 1,000 peer-reviewed articles published between 1993 and 2003. And they found that 0%, exactly 0 of those articles, questioned that consensus. And then they did an equivalent study of popular media articles in roughly the same period, 1988 to 2002. And they found that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And that, of course, was the product of the enormous amount of junk science that had been dumped into this public policy space giving politicians the space they needed to delay acting on this, perhaps the most important public policy question the globe faces for at least 10 years. That was optimistic at the beginning of the uh, Obama administration. I said it was 10 years. Looks like it'll be 12 or 14 years at least. Once again, an easy public policy question which the government gets wrong. Now the point is, in all of these cases, the government gets these questions wrong, either because the government's a bunch of idiots, <laughs> or because they are guided by something other than the reason in these cases. And in my view, our government is not a bunch of idiots. It is something else that accounts for this distortion. And of course, it's not just in the easy cases that this distortion happens. Instead, policy gets bent to those who pay increasingly universally because of this relationship that members have with the interests because of the support lobbyists have given the members. This is an economy. It is an economy which has an effect on public policy. It weakens the effectiveness of the institution of Congress, a wide range of contexts where Congress just simply can't regulate sensibly, and it weakens public trust in that institution. Indeed, the United States Congress is at a historic low in public trust. Decades, for decades, this number has fallen. This number is probably below the number of people who supported the British crown at the time of the revolution. In California, more than 88% of people believe money buys results in Congress because of this pattern of behavior, a belief that produces an enormous cynicism and resulting disengagement of ordinary people with this, the most important democratic branch in our government. This is, it is an economy which has produced a corruption here. And it's produced that corruption because members in Congress have a dependency upon something other than the people, a dependency that distracts them from the people. As they maintain some tiny tie to the people, they have a much more dramatic tie to the funders. And it's that relationship that erodes the integrity of this institution and threatens the democracy. Now, this is an issue that I think is, should be significant to both the right and the left. It's more obviously significant to the left today because as Obama tries to achieve substantial reforms and they are blocked, it seems like this system of corruption just hurts policies on the left. But I think the right needs to recognize as well how this system erodes the capacity of government to serve the objectives of the parties on the right. So if the founding of the current right is Ronald Reagan, we should remember Ronald Reagan's very articulate statement of a fear of government spinning out of control. 
And that fear he attributed to a certain cause, a cause that had both an internal and an external component. The internal component was his constant focus on the threat that bureaucrats had to our democracy. His belief that bureaucrats would constantly push government to become as big and regulatory oppressive uh, as possible. And then there was an external threat as well. As Reagan said, quoting, who he said, a man named Titler, but it's not clear there was a man named Titler, but anyway, this is Reagan's quote. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. So in his mind, the two enemies are bureaucrats and mobs. And these two enemies together would produce enormous growth in government, leading to the eventual bankruptcy of government. Now, in a certain sense, the right is correct about what has happened over the last 40 years. We've seen extraordinary growth of government, as the uh, Heritage Institute uh, recounts. Growth in federal spending has continued to increase uh, in um, a percentage rate over the last 20 years. The growth of the deficit um, has become uh, increasingly significant as well, and federal spending has outpaced median household income. And the prediction of bankruptcy has also, unfortunately, proven correct, as we see the deficit, especially right now, skyrocketing in both Democrat and Republican controls of Congress. The spending has gone through the roof, and deficits now will reach a level that they literally have never seen in the United States history. So both of these predictions, in some sense, we could say were correct. But is it bureaucrats and mobs that have produced this problem? Are these really the cause? So consider a couple examples. First, this is the Communications Act, um, originally passed in uh, 1934. This statute uh, had, has right now six titles. Title II of this statute regulates telecom. Title VI regulates cable. When Al Gore was vice president, he had an idea to take the internet components of Title II and Title VI and put them under a new Title VII and have these internet components essentially deregulated. Minimal regulation below even the network neutrality regulations that are being promoted right now. His chief staff person on this initiative described to me the response that he got to this idea as he took it to the Hill. He recalls one time one member said to him, hell no, how are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? The idea being that regulation is a means to facilitating fundraising back to the members of Congress. So the idea that we use regulation as a tool to facilitate fundraising. Or think about tax extenders. Um, tax extenders relate to these targeted tax benefits, which are fill, which fill our tax code, targeted tax benefits, which are specific tax benefits written in general language, but it turns out to talk about just one or two particular entities. The requirements of pay-go require that these tax benefits get reauthorized every year. And this reauthorization has its own political economy. So as Rebecca Kaisar describes it in this article in the Georgia Law Review, one consequence of that political economy is an explosion in the number of targeted tax benefits. So the cost uh, between 1996 and 2001 for those targeted tax benefits would have been about $22 billion in the 10th year if you wanted to make them permanent. Right now the number is $430 billion in the 10th year to make them permanent. So one question is, why have they exploded so much? And the answer is the dynamic, the political economy of the dynamic when these tax extenders are about to expire is that they provide a huge 
funding opportunity for members of Congress who sit on the committees that oversee whether they will be extended. As the legislators need to consider whether this benefit is extended, they, as she said, act in their own self-interest by extracting rents and pleasing certain constituents without concern for the social welfare costs of doing so. So you might ask, why not eliminate them? Why not eliminate these tax benefits because they're plainly not advancing the general interest of the public? And we can imagine an equivalent response from a member of the House similar to the one that Al Gore's representative got, which would be, hell no, how are we gonna raise money from these targets if we eliminate these targeted tax benefits? So again, we tax for the purpose of raising campaign funds. We're finally referring back to my favorite example of Sonny Bono. This practice of extending the term of existing copyrights is a habit in which Congress cannot ever hope to escape because each time these monopolies are about to expire, the monopoly owners race to Congress and promise them an enormous amount of money in order to extend the term of copyrights. Indeed, in the last 40 years, there have been 11 extension of existing copyrights, copyrights about to expire, and the dynamic pushing for that is predictable and honest. So when will this ever come to an end? Well, again, you can imagine the same response from a member of Congress. How are we ever going to raise money from the copyright holders if we stop the practice of extending their copyright? The point is, in all three cases and in many others, it's the same dynamic, the same political economy of government. The same question that gets asked, how do we architect government to help us raise funds to run the elections we need to get back into power? And that means that the objective of people on the right is defeated as we have more regulation, more complicated taxes, and more senseless monopolies, since each of those things support the fundraising, con fundraising Congress. And so it's no surprise that though we have had 20 years of conservative presidents in the last 29, we have not yet seen smaller government or simpler taxes as a product of their influence. Now, that all might sound bad enough. <laughs> it's only gonna get worse. And the reason for it's getting worse is a decision of the Supreme Court just this term in the case of Citizens United versus the FEC. This case addressed the question whether corporations could be limited in their ability to use treasury funds to spend on independent campaign expenditures at any time before the campaign. The law had banned those expenditures for the 60 days prior to an election. And the court said, interpreting the First Amendment, that can't corporations had an unlimited power to spend independently campaign funds from the corporate treasury for political purposes. Now, we have to put this decision in a little bit of context, so here are some numbers. 2008, Congress raised and spent about $1.4 billion in their election cycle. Of that $1.4 billion, about 10% came from contributions of $200 and less. Last year, Congress the lobbyists spent about $3.5 billion lobbying Congress, right? about twice, more than twice as much as was raised and spent to elect members to Congress. Of that $3.5 billion, less than 1.2% was lobbying by labor unions. Okay, now, you remember in The Inconvenient Truth where Al Gore got to get on that forklift and go way up to the very top to show this sign that showed how far carbon was gonna go up? This is where I would do it here, but there's no forklift, unfortunately. Um, because if you take 1% of the corporate profits of the Fortune 400 in 2008, and you imagine them devoting 1% of their corporate profits to campaign expenditures, and you compare that to these two numbers, $1.4 billion and $3.5 billion, then I would get on my forklift and I would go way, 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 way up to the ceiling to represent the proportion between these numbers. Because 1% is about 
$1.2 billion relative to the $1.4 billion actually raised and spent in Congress in 2008. Now, the Supreme Court anticipated this kind of concern, the concern about extraordinary amount of money that might now be spent in these elections, and they said there's no problem to this because it all can be disclosed. Congress can require disclosure. And so if it's disclosed that Exxon has spent $7 million on your campaign, then the public can incorporate that in their calculation of whether they want to support you or your opponent. But what the Supreme Court didn't know, because the Supreme Court has no actual people who have ever run in an election sitting with the justices on the Supreme Court, is that we can't rely upon disclosure because there's an extraordinary amount of missing money, kind of the dark matter in political expenditures that never get accounted for. And this is why. It's an extraordinary paper by these two scholars talking about the iceberg theory of campaign contributions. And what they tried to do is to understand a puzzle which has um, been the focus of political science for the last 30 years. The puzzle is, if you look at the actual amount of money which corporations spend in elections, it's tiny compared to the amount of benefit they get from the gifts that Congress gives them. So for example, the sugar industry gets a subsidy worth about $1 billion, yet the six major sugar uh, manufacturers in the United States spend just about three and a half million dollars in campaign expenditures to get that one billion dollar subsidy. So you say, shouldn't at least Congress hold out a little bit to get a little bit more for the billion dollars which they're giving in exchange? So that's been the puzzle. Why hasn't there been more money inside the political system? But what these two scholars did was they built a model that said, well actually, the question is not just how much you spend in favor of the candidate you want to elect, but how much you can credibly threaten to give the opponent to the candidate you want to elect. And what they prove in this mathematical economics paper is that the mere threat is enough to induce the policy reaction that they want without ever spending the money. So the sense that this iceberg very tiny about a bit of money on the top that was actually given is still a proxy for a large amount of money threatened but never actually given. Now if you imagine this dynamic in the post-Citizens United world where their capacity is now to give an unlimited amount of money, the implication from that paper is that there is an enormous opportunity now for members to be placed in this puppeteer relation to these funders because the ability to threaten to spend an unlimited amount of money in favor of the opponent will be enough to get most members to pay attention to exactly the policy prescriptions that the threatened party wants and the point is those Threats get recorded nowhere. We have no way to know exactly how much influence has been delivered through this mechanism, and a lot of reason to believe this mechanism actually explains an extraordinary amount of political influence in our system already. So this takes a very bad situation and makes it much, much worse as it reinforces this dependency, not upon the people, but upon this independent influence which is inconsistent with that dependency on the people. So what do you just do in response to these two fundamental problems? I think we need to find a way to restore the integrity to this institution. And from the framers' perspective, what that means is find a way to restore its independence. And from the framers' perspective, what that means is to find a way to restore the proper dependence, which comes from ending improper dependence. And the only way to do that, in my view, is to follow an idea of a Republican about 107 years, 102 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt, when he argued for the first time at a national level for what we could call citizen-funded elections. And this idea has two components. The first component, focusing on the funded part, 
says we need to establish a system, and it, because of the constitutional limitations, it has to be a voluntary opt-in system, where members running for Congress depend upon small dollar contributions only. So a bill in the House right now, Larson Jones bill, which has about 140 co-sponsors called the Fair Elections Now Act, says that a candidate could opt into a system where they receive a maximum contribution from any citizen of $100, and that's matched four to one by the government, so it's worth $500. And the calculations they've made is that that ratio would be enough to lead most members to opt into a small dollar campaign as opposed to the current system, which forces them to raise large contributions, and a small dollar campaign would make it harder for anybody to believe that money was actually buying results. Or an alternative proposed by Professors Ackerman and Ayers, imagine something like a democracy voucher that every citizen, every voter has, a $50 demo democracy voucher, and then you could add the permission for people to give $100 of their own money in addition to that voucher. The magic to the $50 democracy voucher is that actually that produces just about $6 billion if you aggregate all 130, 120 million voters. $6 billion, which would be about five times the amount spent in the last uh, president, uh, uh, congressional election. Now, either way, with either of these two systems, the objective would be to make it so that no one could believe that money is buying results in the system making it possible for us to believe, as we all want to believe, that regardless of the reason that Congress got whatever wrong that it recently got wrong, whether it's because there are too many Democrats or too many Republicans or too many idiots, whatever the reason is, we would not believe it was because of the money. That's objective one. Objective two in citizen-funded elections is to focus on the citizen part. Now, the Supreme Court has gotten a lot of grief from this opinion, because many people read the opinion as an opinion that hangs on the claim that corporations are persons. Of course, the court has said that corporations are persons, but this was nowhere at all in the reasoning of the court in that decision. The court's argument was not that corporations are persons and therefore have First Amendment rights. The court's argument was that the First Amendment is agnostic about the target of regulation, the focus of the First Amendment is the regulation. So that is as true that the First Amendment cares to block regulation if it's the Chinese government as, it's the, as if it's the Chamber of Commerce. Both of these are entities that whether they're persons or citizens or not, according to the Supreme Court's reasoning at least, the First Amendment limits the government's power to suppress their speech. Now, What's the proper response to this kind of decision? Well, unfortunately, I think that we need to begin to think about a constitutional response. Because there is no way to imagine a statutory change to this decision that the court would uphold. And we have to think, figure out what's the appropriate constitutional change that would accommodate the right kind of concern. And in my view, the right kind of concern is not the objective to silence corporations. We should never have as our objective silencing any source of speech. Instead, the thing we should worry about is the marionette dynamic, the puppeteer dynamic that I have described so far. We should worry about a funding structure where members believe they must be dependent upon these funding sources and rely upon those funding sources to get elected and therefore rely on those funding sources in deciding what measures to support. So if Citizens United says that corporations can spend an unlimited amount of money, and by its reasoning, anybody, including uh, the Chinese government, could spend that amount of money, imagine a 28th Amendment that says this. Nothing in this Constitution shall be construed to restrict the power to limit though not to ban campaign expenditures of non-citizens of the United States during the last 60 days before an election. So here's the architecture of this. Whether corporations are persons or not, nobody has ever suggested that they are United States citizens. So they are not citizens, just like the Chinese are not citizens. And indeed, you can think elections are the sort of things that citizens, at their core, should be worried about. 
Now, our concern as citizens should not be to silence non-citizen speech. So this amendment doesn't give Congress the power to do what Congress did in BICRA, which is to say corporations can't speak. But our concern for citizens, uh, citizens should be to make sure that at least in the last 60 days before an election, the focus of citizens is on campaign expenditures by citizens to tell other citizens what they should do in that election. So a corporation should be free to say what they want, but the amount of money they could spend directly or indirectly in a campaign should, in my view, properly be limitable by Congress to make sure that it is citizens that are driving the dependency that Congress feels. The aim of both of these changes is to end this picture of the way government functions. This picture where rather than a dependency in people, there is this dependency on funders. And that objective is the objective to restore the integrity that our forefathers placed in the architecture of this Constitution. Let me make one more point about a conception of responsibility that is behind this argument that I have made today. Responsibility as in our responsibility. Now, everybody's familiar with this picture, which was a picture taken of the Exxon Valdez in 1989 after Captain Joseph Hazelwood ran it aground, spilling about $11 million of oil into the Prince William Sound. This is Captain uh, Hazelwood calling in the accident. Yeah, that's uh, all these back. Uh, we uh, should be on the radar there. We fetched up uh, on the ground north of uh, Goose Island. You want, so you're notified, over. <laughs> now, as you listen to that, you might have had a certain thought, which many people thought at the time of the accident, that perhaps Joseph Hazelwood was under the influence of certain intoxicants at the time when he was supposed to be captaining the supertanker. He claimed he wasn't. He said he had only had four vodkas before he had gotten on the ship. Um, the blood alcohol level the morning after the accident suggested he must have had at least six times the legal limit when he climbed on board that night. But he denied it. His lawyers fought it. There was a huge battle about whether he was drunk. In the end, the conclusion of the courts was that it was indeterminate. There was a doubt. Now, whether there was a doubt about his state of intoxication what there was no doubt about was that he was an alcoholic. His mother testified to the fact after this event occurred. Exxon, four years before the event, had treated him for his alcoholism. After the accident, the president of Exxon said he thought he had mastered his problem, but Exxon had overlooked the fact that in 1986, he had had his driver's license revoked for DUI, and in 1988, he had had his driver's license revoked for DUI. Indeed, at the time he was captaining the super tanker, he was not allowed to drive a VW Beetle because he had no driver's license. But forget Captain Hazelwood for a second. Think about the people around Captain Hazelwood, the other officers, people who could have picked up a phone. Right? While a drunk was driving a super tanker, Think about the people who did nothing about them. What do we think about them? Now, I ask this question because as I think about the problems that we face as a nation, the problems we face in a wide range of institutions that are incapable of doing their job right now, as I think about those problems, I increasingly think that we are they, those people around Hazelwood. 
people who could have picked up a phone. As critical problems in our nation demand serious attention, we have institutions that are incapable of attention. They are distracted from their job, unable to focus, like pilots playing on their laptop when they're supposed to be landing an airplane, or surgeons flirting during surgery with a nurse in the surgeon chamber, or half of you on your cell phones as you're driving down the road. We face these critical problems requiring serious attention, but none of us capable of forcing the institutions back to this attention. Who is to blame for that? Who is responsible for that? It is easy when thinking about these problems of corruption to focus on figures like this, the Blagojeviches in the story. But my view is the problem is not the Rob Blagojeviches. The problem is not the evil people. The problem here is good people, decent people, people who could pick up a phone, us. We, the most privileged in the society, it is our responsibility to fix it. Because the most outrageous part of the story is that each of these corruptions is primed by the most privileged in our society, yet permitted by the passivity of the most privileged as well. That's us. Thank you very much. <laughs>